are going to have a great day. Um, a little bit about myself, I, I think she gave you the intro, but yes, I did start and I worked with Dr. Appel down in Houston, Texas, which was the very first multidiscipline clinic that they had where patients would come in for the day and instead of having an appointment one day and next day, they got to do all the, uh, the uh, visits uh, in one quick, easy step. And it also was interesting because the patients then got to see other patients that were coming in from different parts of the world. And back then in the 80s, like I said, it was the first multidiscipline clinic. So some of the things that I've encountered over the years taking care of patients as a nurse, um, I kind of made into a presentation where as a typical nurse, I'll walk in and the first thing I do is start at your head and I work my way down and see what are some of the issues that you've encountered. So that's kind of how the program's gonna go. Also, I find very often that somebody will have a thought in the middle of a presentation and it's like a flyby. You can't remember it at the end when I say, do you have any questions? So I really don't mind if you wanna put your hand up very quickly because maybe the issue that you're encountering at your house is something that, you know, Mr. Joe Schmo at the end of the row has also been dealing with for quite a long time. So we're gonna start with my first slide and, um, oh yeah, I have the little clicker here. This is all very techno for me today. Here we go. Uh, ALS is not just about an ice bucket. You know, when I started doing this disease, I have seven brothers. I lived in uh, New York and New Jersey. And so when I met my very first patient, I went, oh, I'm taking care of somebody that has the baseball disease. Pride of the Yankees, Lou Gehrig, Yankees, that's all I knew. But as the generations have come up, you would say Lou Gehrig's disease and people wouldn't understand. Thankfully, P Peter Fratz and others in the Boston area came up with this great idea of challenging people with ice bucket challenges. And isn't it been wonderful? It has bring, brought more awareness uh, about this disease and it has also brought the the current generation to know what is going on with this disease. So let's start with our, we're gonna start with the uh, first part of what I said we were gonna do here, moving along. Okay, starting at the top of the head. When I see a patient, basically they have hot and cold flashes. I had a patient that would be in spaghetti straps and she'd be wearing flannels and socks all over the place. So patients have this hot and cold variance. It's very annoying. Gentlemen are predominantly the patients that get ALS, so, so welcome to our world because now you know what hot flashes are all about. So some of the suggestions that I make is that, um, uh, that you have ceiling fans, that you have ways of moving the air around in the room, but the perspiration from just having your skin sweat and then dry is going to cause a lot of flaking especially in the hair region. So you'll have uh, this, almost like a cradle cap, like what babies have, but you'll have this in your hair. Men have it in their beard. They have it on their chest hair. They have it here in their groin. And women suffer from it, of course, underneath their breasts. So keeping the area dry is very important. And so very often when I say to somebody they're gonna get their bath, I said, hey, listen, after you have your bath, just let the air just get to everything and dry because you're gonna be having these hot and cold flashes. And so there's different shampoos and things that you can get uh, that are tar-based that work well. And if it gets severe, then you might have to even go to a doctor and it might be diagnosed as uh, some kind of psoriasis that is, and they can give you creams and lotions for that. Um, I'm gonna to get to eye care here in a minute. Darlene is in the back and she is one of the volunteers today. Thank you, Darlene and she's gonna go around and give out a communication board that I'll be using in about two or three slides from here. So as she's walking around handing these out, you'll understand why we're gonna use that. But eye care is the next thing I see, okay? So patients have this dryness, especially if they have a lot of saliva, they might be on a medication that's gonna dry their saliva. Well, when it dries their saliva, it also dries the mucous membranes in the, uh, uh, the mucous membranes here, but also the eyes here, and other areas that are typically moist. So when a patient has 
ALS is wearing contacts, the first thing I say is it might be a good time to switch to your glasses because I don't know, I wear contacts, I have them on now, but my husband's big hands, if he came at me to put my contacts on, every morning I'd freak. So of course, move away from your contacts and get into your glasses. Make sure that you're using eye drops on a daily basis. And also, first thing in the morning, you're gonna wake up and there might be like this sticky kind of flakiness that's going on with your eyelashes. I keep the area moist because you know your eyes are very important. You can see down to a patient's soul, they used to say, but I can look into somebody's eyes and I can tell if they're hurting, if they're okay, if they're comfortable. And that's what you're gonna want to learn are the things that you need to, in order to take care of your loved one. Okay, let's go back. Teeth, tongue, breath, and gum. Those mucous membranes in there. The tongue is getting flaccid. By flaccid, I mean it's not moving around very well in your mouth. That's why when you put food in, it's almost as if it's trying to go to one side, trying to go to the other side. And as your tongue flattens, that is where your speech is involved, and that's part of that. So I really think oral care is very important because you can off, often get um, a buildup of saliva and, and things on your tongue, and it, and it will feel awful. I mean, it will feel ugh, like you have just a lot of uh, surface. And in the old days, what I did was that I used the back of a spoon and I would kind of uh, brush it out before I would uh, do any kind of uh, brushing of the teeth and building up the handles on the toothbrush so the patient could brush it himself. But you want to know something? Doing good mouth care is going to allow the patient to enjoy his food better. And, and also, because it gets very dry in there, you want to be able to, what, what am I going to use? Am I going to use a mouthwash? And, um, okay, where did I lay my little bag down that I came up with? Oh, is it over on this side? Okay. These are my little tricks that I, I'm, I have to tell you, I usually don't have a room this wonderfully big, but it's, it's a pleasure. Okay, so some of the items that I talk about. Am I doing it? Looks like I'm doing it right. Is OxyFresh. OxyFresh is a product that you can buy online. And the reason I like OxyFresh is because it comes with one of these brushes, which is what we call a tongue scraper. And I will open it up and show it to you in its entirety. But I got together with the OxyFresh company, and I said, you know, a lot of my patients would benefit from this product, but to go online and buy the toothpaste or the mouthwash or this thing, why don't we put it all in like a little trial package so patients can order it. So I, what it has is a mouthwash. And why I like this mouthwash is that if you use certain mouthwashes that have alcohol or sugar in it, it will cause your mouth to become more, um, more dry or you'll make more saliva if it's sweet. You know, when you eat something sweet, you make more saliva. So this product will not do that. It also comes with a small toothpaste which is also available in this kit. The tongue scraper, and what I like especially, is there's this little tube that comes and you can spray. So you spray that into the mouth. And the, the thing being is that we want to have our mouth be for our patient and our loved one. I had a wife, that, a wife that came up to me and said, everything, I'm doing everything fine, but I just, I just, when I go in to give him a kiss, ugh, you know? And I said, well, why don't you try these products? And so she did, and she said, it's wonderful. And when I know that their company is coming, I go up and I his mouth so that when they come ne next to him and they want to lean down and give him a kiss, that he smells good. These products, like I said, have been on the market for over 30 years. The reason I found them is my brother's a dentist, and so he knows about all the issues with saliva, and he suggested these, and so they've been very good. And 
Um, the thing with this product as well, if you go on the website, if you put a little bit of this in your water that you're feeding your dog, your dog's bad breath will go away as well. So it, it's twofold. It's, you know, I'm not saying get it for the dog. I'm just saying that it's a perfect opportunity. Also, if you have somebody that you're taking care of their mouth and they've lost that ability to go, there are products that you can get. And one of them that I recently was able to find is that this is a toothbrush. And I'll just open it up. I got a box of these at home, but so I can show you. If you have a suction machine because your uh, loved one is sitting maybe and having a lot of saliva during the day. So this is at the end of a suction catheter. And you can put it in your mouth. And here is the toothbrush part. And here is a spongy part. So you can do all the brushing and then you hold it and it will suck it all out so that you don't have to have somebody feeling like they have to go. And they're like, well, how do I rinse out his mouth? Get inventive, there are certain things. Get that turkey baster out and squirt it. Always squirt from the sides, guys, because if you squirt this way, they might aspirate. So squirting to the sides and letting them go like this is gonna be better than just squirting it down. So that's a good way to do the oral care, which is what I think is really important. Also, there's another thing you can buy at the, at the store right now, which is biotin. And uh, my patients like biotin as well. Maybe not as well, but you know, pretty close. And all right, so the rest of the little goodies in here are for some of the other things I'm gonna be showing you as we proceed. So being able to find the the, the software that's right, putting the software on your iPad so that you can walk around and show people, and an enlarged keyboard. And the bulbar issue is one where, you know, you think you're being understood, but the people are standing there because they don't know whether your F or Fs or Fs and or X are all the same because your tongue is flying out. And you'll find that you get nasal, and you get very sound very throaty. And so what happens is that you take that air in, and you elevate your voice to understand me, but you're not being understood. And so it's important to say, OK, guess what? I can't understand me now. I'm going to find a way. And so one of the things that I developed I think it's the next slide, and we're going to be able to play with it up here, is the board that's been going around. OK, this is my eye language board. I developed this back in 1985 for an ALS patient in Houston, Texas. Now, mind you, there was no computers then back in the home. He was 35 years old, big Exxon exec. And I came in to show him this board. And I'll tell you what his reaction was as soon as I teach you all what this board is. So if he's looking on this side, I knew that he was looking at one, two, three, four. Because it's reflective here for the caregiver. If he was looking over here, he was looking at five, six, seven. OK, it isn't either of those, then it must be who, what, where, where. OK, so you want to know where someone is or something, someone. OK, spell me that person's name. All right, so I'm going to play this as if I were um, the patient and the caregiver. And then I'm going to practice with you all so that you can take this home and you can have this as a tool, all right? So my husband's name is, I'm over here at five. Five, mm-hmm, Q-R-S-T, mm-hmm. Okay, you're over here, is it one, two, three, four, mm-hmm, M-N-O, mm-hmm. OK, so far, I have a T and an O. OK, here we are. One, two, three, four, hmm, M, hmm. 
So far, I have a T-O-M. So my husband's name is Tom. In this world of text messaging, people develop ways of being able to say things very quickly. But I'm going to play with all of you, OK? So you are going to guess what my daughter's name is, all right? So somebody speak out, or all of you speak out. My daughter's name is? One, two, uh. Uh. No, I made a mistake. <laughs> okay. Five. Five. You are. Uh. One, two, three. I am Aaron. Aaron. That was very good. But it could have been Erica, couldn't it? It could have been another name. Now, we as women, we like it that you're guessing, that we can get to the next word, OK? You guys want to spell every single <laughs> letter out. Isn't that right, Brian? Yes. OK. So uh, does Brian have a middle name? OK, Brian, I'm going to play with the table here. And then we're going to do mine one more time. So that I understand, I, mean, I understand that you folks all understand how to use this. OK, Brian, what's your middle name begins with five? You're looking over here. Five, six, six. OK, hold on. Right, you're supposed to nod when they. Or go, mm. I had one guy stick out his tongue. All right. OK, five. OK, Q, R, S, T, T. Next letter. Looks like it's over on this side. One, two, three, four, M, N, O, O. Oh, boy. Next letter. Over this side. One. Is it one? I'm sorry. One, two, three, four, M, are you, OK, next letter. Was that Tom? Is it any more? Now, how could we get two Toms? <laughs> two Toms in one. It isn't Thomas? It is Thomas. Now, why did you spell Thomas? Because I'm with my wife. <laughs> now we're going to be talking about nutrition. Because we got into the eyes, we did the mouth, and now we're going to be talking about nutrition. And as you can see, I have a. Um, what do they call it? A magic bullet. They have all these kind of bullet things. And they're great. And that's what you need to do is start taking things. Perhaps if it's difficult to chew and swallow, make sure the food that you're taking in, like we had today, we had this wonderful oatmeal and we had raisins and butter and cranberries and brown sugar. Get your calories in first thing in the morning because our calories are what we need to keep ourselves going. OK? And so if things get more difficult during the day, then you can puree them or put them in the magic bullet, and we can then swallow them. Don't put anything into your mouth that's going to break up and make it difficult for your tongue to get around. Granola bars, uh-uh. Potato chips, no. Pretzels, no. Uh, anything kind of candy that has a caramel and it's going to be on your teeth and that tongue can't get over there to get it off. Be careful. Those are things that we shouldn't be eating. You can get very nutritious things and get them into your mouth and down easy. Macaroni and cheese with extra cheese. Mashed potatoes. Things that are going to keep our weight up. And like I said, you have a progressive weight loss. Your fluid intake is poor. You have reduced calories. So what happens when you reduce the calories? The muscles that you're using to get up off the toilet or to be able to walk, they're going to be the ones that are shrinking because they're looking for nutrients. The little attachment that goes to that button, and then you can put your funnel. Who developed the Mickey button? The Mickey button was developed for children. They found that when they put these things in kids, kids were ripping them out. If they put it right on here, 
and then were able to put their panties or clothes on, children didn't take it out as much. But it is, it is uh, viable for, for adults now, and this is another way of doing it, especially like that lady who still had use of her hands and so forth. Um, I also have a regular feeding tube, the one that he was describing. I have it up here. It's wrapped up, but you're welcome to come on up and look at it, and you can take it out of the package. And last but not least, patients were saying to me, oh, I, get, I, I think I have some food caught in my, on my tube, or do I have to get it changed if I get things caught in it? And usually I will advise them how they can unclog it if maybe they put something down there that's too thick. But this is also, it is called a declogger, which is available. It's tiny, it's thin, and it's just kind of like a little rotor rooter so it cleans out the edges. But on a regular basis, I always tell my patients to maybe rinse it through with something that is carbonated, and then they can kind of rub the tube like this to get any of the, any of the food that has been caught on it. So this is the issues on feeding, which like I said, I think is very important because you want to keep those muscles that you've got, you want to keep them strong. If you're still able to be stood and you can stand in a standing position so that you can be pivoted and sat down, that's important, okay? Here are some pieces of equipment that I use for my patients. We use the cough assist, um, we use the vest, we use uh, other pieces of equipment that are going to help with the congestion that we have, because we want to avoid any kind of pneumonia. And, you know, the doctor might give you an inhaler or breathing. As you can hear, I don't sound like this regularly. I got off the plane and this is what I sound like. So the allergens are different all over the country. Making sure you get your flu shot and that you keep up with it. But when you're in bed and you're sleeping, your lungs are going like this. As soon as you sit up and you're in a sitting position and you start to take that full breath, patients are gonna feel congested. They're gonna feel as though they need to get their lungs opened. So the doctor might order breathing treatments, which have a little bit of albuterol, a little epinephrine, keeping those lungs open because as long as we can keep the lungs open, then the blood is gonna circulate and everything is gonna stay the same. However, the vest that you're wearing here can be something that will help and will shake you up in order to help you loosen up those secretions and be able to spit them out or be able to suction them out. And so when I have a patient, and before they came up with the vest, let me tell you, I would have a patient, I would give him his breathing treatment. Is it okay if I use you, Mr. Kelly? Tom, just, that's right, Tom. Okay, another Tom. Three Toms in a row, okay. So I would give somebody a breathing treatment. I'd make sure that they had a, taken a sip of something so that their throat and everything that I wanted it to come up was gonna be moist and not dry. And I would have them lean forward because if you're leaning on your bed or you're leaning back, the chest cannot open. And so what I would do is I would cup my hands and I would do this. And what that is loosening up the secretions because the secretions in our lungs, this is our lung alveoli, okay? And they get mucus on them. But when we sleep at night, we get a cold or a pneumonia or congestion. The mucus all starts sticking together. And, the, and that when you feel like your chest feels like you have an elephant sitting on it. If anybody here has had one of those kind of colds. So you have to open it up. So the epinephrine does this, it opens it up. But by using the vest or some kind of manual thing, such as padding, this is called CPT. And you're going to go from the bottom up because that's what you're trying to loosen up the stuff and you're trying to bring it up and you're going to be able to get the lungs clear and so those are important factors on a daily basis i make sure that if i have any patient that i feel needs this first thing in the morning or right before we go to bed so we have a good night's sleep and just bring all that secretion up oh 
don't try to do this after you've eaten. Like I said, first thing in the morning, you haven't had anything on your stomach yet. And before you go to bed, hopefully all you've had is all your nighttime medications and your little routine that you do before you go to bed. We have BiPAP masks. BiPAP masks are in order to give us that extra air. And you know who came up with these BiPAP masks? It was in Houston, Texas, that um, Dr. Appel had a few patients whose force vital capacity just didn't seem to be changing. And both of those patients were sleep apnea patients. So they were on a CPAP. So what they did is they changed it around and they made it into a BiPAP, which is bilateral positive air pressure, which is different from a CPAP, but it looks the same. And it provides you with better sleep. The only thing that I think is very difficult for some patients, and I always say to them, if that mask doesn't feel comfortable on you, there are 90 different masks out there. Don't settle for just the generic mask. There are patients that use one kind of mask during the day because they're using their eyes on the computer, and they wear another kind of mask at night. So make sure you get the mask, and somebody will say to me, I tried it, I can't stand it, it just drives me crazy. I said, guess what? If you're trying it at night before you go to bed, and you haven't worked with it before, you're too tired, it's gonna feel annoying. Start during the day. When's the best time to start? After you've eaten. We all could take a nap, a little nap, after we've had a nice lunch. So I used to say to my ladies or my men, put the mask on, lay back, watch one of the soaps, watch ESPN, and give the mask a chance. Do it 25 minutes, three times a day, work yourself up to it, and then you'll be able to get into sync to be able to use it at night, because that's what you need to carry.